welcome to Union Chapel this morning. It's a bank holiday weekend, so we seem to be fewer in number than usual, but um, we'll make up for it by singing twice as loud. That's okay with you. Um, and a special welcome to Daisy Ann. And Viva Daisy Ann is going to say a few words during the course of the service. She is uh, here um, to suss us out, really, to see if we, she, she'd like to come and work with us. So we'll just uh, see what happens this morning. So looking forward to that. And we're going to have lunch after the service, so anybody's welcome to, to stay and have lunch. There's really nice food available. Trust me. Excellent. So let's begin by singing the day of resurrection. We're still in the Easter season. The day of re resurrection. Earth, tell it out abroad.
In you, we find our true identity, learning both who we are and who we can be. Be with us, Lord, as we gather in your precious name. Chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. 
Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, and honour and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven on earth, and under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying to the one seated on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might, forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. sitting comfortably, this is quite a long while. The second reading is taken from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together was Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, Is it the Lord? When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, 
and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went abroad and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And, there, and though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said unto him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him, sorry, Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten the belt around you and take you to where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Consciences have been prodded in recent weeks by climate change protests of extinction rebellion, and I think they've been very successful in bringing the concerns of the future of creation to the centre of public attention. Today is the third Sunday of Easter, and we heard another account of Jesus appearing to his disciples. Jesus had been tried and put to death because he was a political and religious disruption. His trial was of dubious legitimacy. The aim of his death, of his killing, was to snuff out his challenging message. But it didn't work out that way. He came back to life in a new and never before known way. People who are executed because of their religious and political dissent, are supposed to stay dead. They're not supposed to come back to life. They may be remembered for a while, and even have a mention in a few history books, but they're not to be an ever-present reality in human affairs. The attempt to make the gospel message of love and peace extinct did not work. Jesus rebelled. 
He refused to lie down in a dark grave, but craved the sunlight of his community. The resurrection is extinction rebellion writ large. The passage tells from John tells of a rich encounter with his disciples. It recounts their recognition of Jesus as a continued presence. It also records Jesus showing how we will relate with each other as part of the risen body of Christ. And there's a kind of feeling of deja vu in the story. Once again, the disciples struggle to catch fish. Jesus, once again, shows them a different way. Cast your net to the right side, and there are masses of fish. Once again, Jesus is saying, the resources you need to live the gospel are all there. If only you will do things differently, think differently, and try something new and unexpected. The disciples were fishing in the dark. We too fish around in our spiritual blindness, believing that nothing can be done. We cannot change things for the better. We are too few to make a difference, and no one listens anyway. Spiritual blindness. Jesus does not appear in the night of despair, but stands on the shore at dawn as the sun shatters the darkness. And once again, Jesus invites his disciples to share a meal this time of bread and fish. Come and have breakfast. It's great, isn't it? It's a great line, just come and have breakfast. In the fellowship of the meal, the eating and drinking together, they recognize and they know. Not long before, in front of a charcoal fire in the house of Caiaphas, Peter had denied that he knew Jesus. Just these few days later, he is told by the disciple Jesus loved who the stranger on the shore is. This time, he jumps into the water and rushes to Jesus, no longer naked with shame, but fully clothed, ready to follow and to serve. And there is Jesus inviting him to a meal cooked on a charcoal fire. This is Peter's redemption. And Jesus gives an instruction to Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Jesus has a deep affection for his followers. He knows from bitter experience that change is anything but easy. Peter's own death by crucifixion is foretold. We are people who are open to recognizing Jesus. The disciple in Jesus' story had an advantage over us. They had seen Jesus before. They knew what he looked like. They knew how he operated. But we too have our experiences. And those experiences accumulate over life, our lifetime. In our worship, in our sharing of bread and wine, in our private prayer and devotion, we experience the risen Christ. And each time we speak with him, we learn how to recognize him. But we also recognize him in daily encounters. We can hear echoes of his voice in our contemporary prophets. We can see something of Jesus in the rebellions and actions for justice. To recognize Jesus is to acknowledge who he is. It is the Lord. It is the Lord. Jesus to us is our inspiration, our guiding star, our hope in dark times. He is the one to whom we give allegiance and invest our dreams and aspirations. We are people who break bread and share the rich resources of faith with each other and with the world. We belong. Come and have breakfast. We belong. We extend this outwards to sharing our resources with others, whether they be our money, our buildings, our inheritance as a church. And finally, being with the risen Christ is to be in a mutually supportive community.
whether we are mutton or lamb, we are to be fed. The Christian way develops and grows through caring and bold leadership. All of us are to be nourished by the gospel. All of us are given the benefit of the, the experience of those who have gone before in faith. And all have to consider our responsibilities in caring for and supporting the discipleship of the people of faith. I once met the Namibian artist John Mapungale, who was born in a rural part of Namibia under the apartheid regime. With little education and mental health problems, he became one of Africa's best known artists. And one of his woodcuts just has people greeting each other and the words hope and optimism in spite of present difficulties. Hope and optimism in spite of present difficulties. To be Christ's rise up people is to stand firm with hope and optimism in spite of present difficulties. Amen. And I invite Daisy Ann to share some thoughts as well. Well, that they couldn't even pull back into the boat. 
So, through acting in faith, you could say, so basically this um, passage, as the Brethren Warren was saying, there's a sort of deja vu happening. So, in this particular scene, it links into when um, we see... Where we basically see, I think it was Peter, John, and some other disciples. Again, they couldn't um, cast and um, bring fish in. And Jesus basically says to him, okay, this is how you go about it. And they did it. And again, they had a lot of fish. So through them listening to Jesus' um, instructions, they actually gained redemption in a way. Because as soon as they um, do this, it's John. So John was there in the first instance, and John is here again. And John immediately recognises that it's Jesus, but before he didn't recognise it's Jesus. So it's sort of like a trigger for him that, oh, okay, I know who this man is. Again, the third um, Bible passage to look, well, to look at in this passage is to do with, as Reverend Vaughan also said, the redemption of Peter. As we said before, like, Peter denied Jesus three times. And in this passage, let me actually read it out. So it's John 21, 15 to 17. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. And again, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus asked Peter three times if he loves him, and three times Peter says that he does. Again, the, it draws a parallel to uh, Peter denying um, Jesus three times. So just as Peter publicly denied Jesus three times, Jesus then publicly allows Peter to declare his love for him. So again, you see, it's a parallel. So at first, you can say in the first instance, Peter felt shame, but now he sort of, Jesus is even saying to him, you know, do you love me more than these? So as Reverend Vaughan said, there's like an affectionate relationship between Peter and Jesus. So with this passage in terms of redemption, again, it goes to show us as people in our lives, there are times where we do deny Jesus or you sort of drift away from God because of, say, your own personal experiences or you may be going through a hard time or anything else like that. But what this shows us is that Jesus is always there and he's always willing to sort of reach out that hand and say, no child, I still love you despite anything else like that. And we see this happening with Peter and Jesus. Again, the second theme that I want to talk about is purpose. So, in terms of purpose in this passage, you'd think that after Jesus has died, and these disciples have spent, what, three years with Jesus, after they've seen his death, they've been going out and saying the good news. But instead, they go back to what they know, which is fishing. They go back to being fishermen. However, what we see here, as I said before, um... In a, so, as I was saying before, I talked about um, the whole them with, uh, doing the fishing sort of thing, and Jesus saying to him, okay, this is how they go about it, again, mirroring what I said before with um, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, when they were four, first called to Christ to become fishers of men. And as I said before, in doing this action, it's John who then says, actually, it's Jesus. So although these disciples have gone back to what they know, which is fishing, they've actually gone back to the mentality of not actually being fishers of men. And through seeing Jesus, and through doing the action again, which Jesus again is the one to tell them how to go about it, they're then reminded of their purpose that, you know what, we're not just supposed to be fishers of normal fish, but we're supposed to fish for men. And as I said before, it was John who, after doing this action, immediately recognises and says, actually, yes, the man of the shore is Jesus. Again, Reverend Vaughan also talked about this, but it's also to do with, you know, Jesus actually preparing the breakfast for them. So, in this um, scene, it's sort of reminiscent, well, it is, it's reminiscent of the Last Supper. And in the Last Supper, Jesus, you know, shares bread, shares wine with his disciples, gives them um, bread, breaks it for them, you know, he says, do this in memory of me, drink my blood in memory of me. Again, as I said before, it's almost as if after Jesus' resurrection, I mean Jesus' death, these people are deflated, so they go back to what they know. But in having this um, breakfast with Jesus, I think they are reminded of the Last Supper, and they are reminded that, you know what, we are disciples of Jesus, this is what we're supposed to do. Yes, we can't just go back to what we know, of just fishing for normal fish, but actually being fishers of men. Again, purpose links again into Jesus' conversation with 
and Peter. So Jesus doesn't just redeem Peter, but he also reinstates Peter. As we know, Peter is the rock of the church. So when Jesus reinstates, what I found really interesting is that I was reading this other uh, passage and it was basically talking about the Greek word of love that is used in this um, passage when Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And the Greek word that he uses is agape, which is um, unconditional love. So Jesus isn't just asking Peter, oh, do you, do you love me as a brotherly love? But it's unconditional love. So he's saying to Peter that the love you want from me, you, the love I want you to have is the sort of love that I have for my people. I want you to have this love for, church, for the church. And also, in Jesus reinstating Peter, after he asked him three times, just as he, so, so sort of to affirm, to confirm that do you understand what I'm actually asking of you? And Peter three times does say, yes, Lord, I love you, and everything else like that. So after Jesus asks him three times, Peter replies three times, then Jesus then goes on, and you can call it prophesy, about Peter's purpose. And he says that, for example, um, his change from adulthood, childhood to adulthood. So he says, in childhood, you can do whatever you want. You could do where you want. You could do what you wanted to do. But in adulthood, you basically you, other people tell you what to do, in sort of thing. And he also talks about his hands being held out wide. And again, that goes to show that Jesus is saying, prophesying about Peter's. I'd say Peter's ministry, and as we all know, just as Jesus was crucified, um, Peter is also crucified, so you can say that sort of imagery for that crucifixion, so death by crucifixion. So, as I was saying before, in bringing up these two things, like looking at this Bible passage and linking in these two themes, what it really reiterated to me is that in through knowing God, again, it's like a cycle, like we're people, we go through things, you go through hard times, but anyone can seek redemption. If someone like Peter, who publicly denied Jesus three times, can seek redemption and actually become such a pivotal part in Christianity, then how much more us? And it also goes to show us, in getting to know Jesus, you get to know more about your purpose, and I strongly do believe, and it's also written in the book, that each person has their own purpose in life. And through getting to know God, you're able to know this purpose and then, you know, basically carry out what God has ordained you to do, just as he did with Peter. So those are just my few, my two pence worth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Daisy Anna. church. We thank you for the refreshing ministry of young people. We thank you for hope and optimism for our future. And we pray for those people who struggle for the future of the planet. We pray for those people who take personal risk in that struggle. We pray for people who defend human rights throughout the world. We pray also, Lord, for those people who have suffered for their faith, thinking especially of the Christians in Sri Lanka at this time and also for people of other faiths, of the Muslim faith particularly, who face backlash of hatred from people who really should know better. And we pray, Lord, for all in need this morning, for those who are sick, for those who are in need of healing, for those who are bereaved, for those who are sad, and we pray, Lord, for strength and wisdom and insight in the days ahead. For our country, for the difficult situation that we find ourselves in and the difficult decisions still to be made, the impacts of political thought. 
Lord, we come to you with our prayers. We come to you offering our concerns for the world and bring those prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. And I offer to him, Christ is alive, let Christians sing.
Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks. We are gathered together to give thanks for the power of God working in creation, energizing life, restoring, recreating, refreshing, renewing. We give thanks for the stories which have made us the people we are, for the great story of our freedom, bringing hope to all enslaved today, for the message and mission of Jesus, the dawning light of a darkened world, for the living presence of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. We give thanks that through this meal we can enter into the comfort of Christ's presence. We know that we are not alone, but share this meal with all who gather in the name of Jesus and people of faith throughout the ages. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. So we pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit, through whom we recognize the presence of Jesus, who on the same night that he was betrayed took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, Drink all of this. It is the blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this bread and share this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come. Pour down your spirit on your church gathered here today. Grant us grace to be true disciples and faithful followers of the gospel of Christ. Receive the prayers of your people for the poor, the hungry, the mourning, the persecuted, that justice and truth will dawn in resurrection power. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing.
risen Lord, we recognize you here, with us in bread and wine, in prayer, in fellowship with each other, and in love for the world. Stand with us in the days and years ahead, that your gospel will bring fresh hope to humanity, and your spirit once again will renew the face of the earth. Amen. to Daisy Ann and Lawrence for playing the organ this morning. The only announcement for this week is that the Sacred Justice Circle is on Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock, um, probably be in the church office. Um, and we're having lunch together afterwards, so we'll be in the committee room. Anybody is welcome to stay and have something to eat with us. So we close our service with the hymn, Jesus is Lord, that creation's voice proclaims it, Jesus is Lord. Sustainer and Redeemer, be with us all, this week and forevermore. Amen.